This is an interview with Eugene I. Goldman for the SEC Historical Society's Virtual Museum and Archive on the History of Financial Regulation. Today is February 21st, 2023, and I'm Kenneth Durr. Eugene, it's a pleasure to talk to you today. Thank you, Ken. Look forward to it. Well, let's uh, start from the beginning and get a little bit about your background. Where are you from originally? I'm from uh, New York originally. And I came to the Washington area in 1969. What brought you to D.C.? I attended American University. Okay. Now, I understand that you were involved in some political action work back at that point. Tell me just a bit about that. Yes, yeah, so I was fortunate enough to have as my congressman, Allard Lowenstein, and uh, we became uh, quite close, and that was a motivating factor for me to want to go to school in Washington. Were you involved in the Dump Johnson movement back then? I helped, not the Dump Johnson campaign explicitly. I did some work for Lowenstein when he ran for Congress in 68. Uh, did not know him during that campaign. It was only until after he got elected when I started to hang out at his uh, district office, not too far from my home, uh, that I got to know him uh, quite well and was very active in his re-election efforts, as well as another campaign years later in Brooklyn. Okay. So you studied political science at AU, is that right? Yes, right. Government. Okay. Was your thought to become a lawyer at some point or get into government? Uh, public policy. Yes, that was in the back, back of my mind. Okay. Um, how about law school? I went to uh, Catholic University at night, mm -hmm. uh, and I worked during the day for a nonprofit organization that was being run by Governor George Romney after he had left government. Okay. And the organization was the National Center for Voluntary Action, and it was basically a national advocacy uh, for volunteer work. Uh, they had affiliates in a lot of uh, counties and cities called Voluntary Action Centers, and they matched uh, volunteer opportunities with individuals. My job was to advocate on behalf of the volunteers. Various pieces of legislation impacted their work. And um, uh, he was a great man. And again, I was uh, privileged just to, uh, to work for his organization and to get to know him. Wonderful person. So you you got out of Catholic with a with a law degree, right? Uh, was did you get any securities law along the way in there, or the, the, just to uh, corporations study of corporations? Okay. How did that take you to the SEC? Well, in the uh, first four or five months of the uh, Carter administration. I went to work for the head of the Action Agency, which housed the Peace Corps, VISTA, and other federal volunteer programs. It was basically the federal version of the Romney non private nonprofit group. And the head of uh, the organization, Sam Brown, uh, I knew from uh, the anti-war movement. Um, and I was waiting to hear whether I had passed the bar and um, at the same time, uh, I thought of the SEC because I was very cognizant of the fact that uh, the SEC was at the forefront in efforts to uh, clean up uh, corporations uh, for the betterment of uh, capitalism and free markets. And um, I was waiting here whether I passed the bar. Um, and in the meantime, um, through a mutual friend, I met uh, Richard Crowd, who's assistant director of enforcement under, under Sporkin, and I had an interview with him, which led to interviews with others, including Stanley, where at the end of the interview, slouching on his couch, using his elbow, he pressed the intercom button and said, uh, get, get the papers going on this guy. So I had, I had a choice to make basically to uh, uh, enjoy the court administration, Enjoy Sam Brown. Uh, he did a you know great job there, 
I felt the best use of my legal skills would be to uh, go to enforcement and join what was uh, well considered the you know, the best law enforcement unit in the federal system at the time. This was uh, 77? Is that right? Yes. Okay. Um, give me a little bit more on enforcement when you came in. What was what was your impression of the place? Um, you know, I, I would assume that, that Sporkin's personality set some of the tenor, but just just characterize how enforcement worked, um, what what the office was like at the time. Through uh, Sporkin's efforts and the others in the division, uh, through the voluntary disclosure program, where you know, 500 companies disclosed uh, questionable payments, um, Congress had enacted the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act in 1977. That's the year I joined uh, the commission. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that was viewed as a confirmation and a recognition of the need for legislation as a result of uh, all the uh, efforts that the SEC was making in uh, the improper uh, payment uh, program. So that obviously uh, contributed to uh, uh, an, an enthusiasm for, for the work of the division. And we also understood that uh, uh, Stanley, uh, through the use of equitable powers of the courts, if he, you know, he, he understood that getting an injunction was not enough to deter. And uh, uh, he had uh, envisioned the need to have federal courts go beyond the injunction uh, and grant ancillary relief, uh, including uh, um, restrictions on board membership, things of that nature. So it was a, uh, a very uh, important time, very uh, aggressive time. Uh, and it was, you know, being recognized, I think, in the country as, you know, doing doing great public service. Right. Now, foreign corrupt practices work was in the news, um, but I assume that the work in enforcement was went way beyond that. Um, where did you fit in when you joined? I was in the branch of corporation finance. So this is a branch which received referrals from our colleagues who uh, had the job of reviewing uh, SEC filings. And through the comment process, uh, at times they would seem to believe that something was amiss at the company, the, 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 the filings, the disclosures were just not right. So the unit I was in, uh, the branch of corporation finance would get the referrals from corporate finance. But in those days, you know, there was also a branch of investment management, and uh, but there was no strict restrictions uh, that you know you couldn't do work on a proper payments case because you're in one of these branches. And that was the principal uh, goal of the branch that I was in. But it, it, it you know, but the work branched out into uh, other areas. So you ended up, you might end up working on one of the IM referrals, something like that. I would end up working on an improper, an improper payments case. Okay. For example, uh, we did have a, a, a great referral that led to a, a big case called SEC versus Catawba. And that was a result of a referral from corporation finance <laughs> where just something just was not right. And uh, we brought that action involved uh, undisclosed self-dealing uh, misrepresentations regarding uh, review of related party transactions and compensation flowing to management through management agreements. So that I could say that uh, uh, that referral worked out and commission approved the action and uh, we obtained inju inju uh, injunctions against several people and companies with uh, cash payments and uh, forgiveness of royalties totaling about $900,000. Take me through how how the process works. You, you, you've got a referral from Corp Pen. 
and they they said we're we've got some some reason to suspect there's something going on here um i would assume that that it wasn't much information it wasn't enough for you to build a case talk about building that case doing doing the uh the investigation work that it required so we would uh, huddle with uh, the branch chief assistant director um, sometimes the associate director and we would decide what requests we would make uh, to the company uh, for further information. And depending on the response, uh, we then would have to uh, go to the commission in those days. Commissions had to you know, approve formal orders investigation. Uh, and once we got the order with subpoena power, we would then be able to take some testimony and get uh, further documentation. It would allow us to go outside the company to the extent there were, you know, related party transactions with third and, and transactions with third parties. So uh, we could test better what, what the company was telling us. Uh, but again, a lot, you know, a lot of my work was not confined to uh, referrals. And a lot of the work in my branch uh, by others was not uh, constrained. It, you know, the the front office would say, "Well, we'll give this one to uh, Sundex people or somebody el else's people." Uh, some of it depended upon whether a particular unit had had time to dig in. Um, so it was a uh, basically a, a work management issue mm -hmm. as opposed to staying in a lane and only getting referrals and then going to work on those referrals. Right. If you were open, you'd get the case. Right. Who was your superior? I had uh, my time and I was there from August of 77 till October of 83. I had several branch chiefs. I had uh, Rich Morvillo. I had Ken Lay, Paul Fisher, and Joel Goldstein. Um, Gary Sundick was the assistant director after Dick Kratt left. And I think he, he, he remained my assistant director throughout. Um, and I will, you know, obviously I would also interface with uh, uh, Ted Levine and others uh as as matters came up you, you mentioned the voluntary disclosure program which grew out of the foreign corrupt practices act um and and that was uh, you know that's sort of a legendary spark and in innovation um talk about some of the other things that he was uh, some of the other ways that he was reorienting uh enforcement uh the gatekeepers uh, theory, access theory, for example, going after uh, lawyers and, and uh, accountants. Um, did, were you involved in cases that worked along those lines? I did have a case involving an attorney, uh, but uh, I think that was an injunctive action. But what Stanley did, he dusted off the old Rule 2E which allowed the uh, commission to authorize the staff to bring administrative proceedings against accountants and attorneys. And uh, he made speeches about the gatekeepers. There were cases brought against uh, auditors uh, under, under 2E that sent a big message. Uh, Again, he was looking for ways, given his limited resources and limited statutes, how could he best protect the investing public with what he had? So the 2E, the gatekeeper concept, was certainly an important one. And as I mentioned before, um, having courts use the equitable powers of the courts to go beyond the injunction to grant ancillary relief uh, was was another very important one. And gatekeepers uh, program is still talked about today. I remember um, 
Steve Cutler, when he was director of enforcement, made a speech on gatekeepers years after Stanley was, uh, yeah, years after Stanley left the commission and uh, made a, a speech how important uh, the program was to continue to uh, serve as a watchdog over the gatekeepers. Do you think that's continued? Yes. In, in the years and decades since you've yes. been in? Another thing uh, Sporkin did was set up a trial unit. I, th I think the idea was that, you know, the, the corporations have got these great lawyers and these great teams. Um, and he wanted to, to bring a little heavier firepower on the SEC side. Were you involved with the trial unit at any, at any point? I was involved in consulting the trial unit on my cases in the event we have to go to trial. Uh, in those cases, uh, settled. We had set up the strategy for trial, but uh, I was very cognizant of the uh, trial unit. Um, got to know Ben Greenspoon and joined uh, scores of others in the division with admiration for, for Ben and what he was able to do. It, it, res it resulted from the recognition that I just mentioned that Stanley was going to push the statute and he would need great advocates in court to convince the judges that the uh, equitable powers uh, are fully usable by the courts in uh, deterring uh, fraud. Talk about Ben Greenspoon. Um, tell me a little more about him. Um, did he Did he come in from the outside? What was his experience and what made him stand out? Don't remember exactly where he came from. Um, what stood out to me was his toughness while having an incredible sense of humor. Uh, he would uh, be full of uh, jokes and stories, a great lunchtime uh, person uh, to hear from and so while he instilled, you know, a real determination uh, to to win in court, it was always with uh, uh, a great deal of humor, and that uh, I think that served his program well. Tell me about, um, you know, I, I assume you started as as a as a at the bottom and worked your way up. Talk about the process of doing that. What kind of, of work uh, challenges were you given? And how soon were you, did you start to, to pick things up and run them on your own? Well, I think uh, one of the greatest challenges I had was when I was asked to uh, work on the Textron investigation. Uh, the Textron investigation grew out of Senate Banking Committee confirmation hearings of G. William Miller to be on the Federal Reserve Board. Uh, he was chairman of Textron uh, at the time of the hearings and many years before CEO or, or chairman. And during the course of his hearings, Proxmire staff received information that suggested that improper payments were made by Textron in Iran and in Ghana. And in light of that information, um, the commission authorized an investigation. I was assigned to the investigation. It was a, a long investigation. We produced a, a staff report, which uh, Proxmire published, which you have, um, and the SEC also filed an action, and that involved uh, scores of on-the-record on the testimony, international travel, a review of uh, you know thousands and thousands of documents, and piecing together a story uh, where the commission uh, alleged uh, a good number of uh, improper payments all over the world. Uh, so, between traveling overseas, uh, taking uh, on-the-record testimony, 
I'm not sure whether I'll, I'll ever again be able to ask someone whose occupation and person says I'm not a nominee or chairman of the Federal Reserve Board. Uh, it was, uh, you know, very high profile for obvious reasons. Uh, Proxmire kept uh, interest in the investigation, had asked for a reporting investigation, which uh, we provided. And I think that uh, I think that that case kind of stood out. What what kind of travel did you do? Where did where did you go to uh, <clears throat> information for this case? I took uh, in those days Freddie Laker Airlines, you know, deeply discounted. Uh, so Stanley couldn't be accused of uh, you know, perks and expenditure, you know, wide expenditures. And I met a uh, a sales agent for Bell Helicopter. Most of these Textron sales were sales of uh, Bell Helicopters to uh, governments all over the world. And a sales agent agreed to be deposed at the uh, US Embassy. Uh, so that was one trip. And then there was another trip uh, to Paris where we talked to another sales agent. But, uh, you know, we didn't have uh, cell phones uh, to, to communicate with the, with the foreign witnesses. A lot of that was done by telexes with their counsel, uh, phone calls at appointed times, uh, but it, you know it worked worked out okay. It worked it worked out okay. It sounds like Senator Proxmire was pretty pretty interested in this uh, how, how this case was being developed. Did you actually get to speak to him at some point? Didn't speak to him personally, but we spoke to his Senate staff. That it came out that. Uh, he was provided uh, incomplete information in response to his inquiry about the Ghana transaction. And it came out later that, you know, the day after Proxmire asked Mr. Miller about Ghana, uh, a Bell helicopter employee destroyed a key document. And there were other efforts on the way where the uh, real facts did not come out until uh, our, our investigation. And so he he felt perhaps just from talking to his people that you know he wished he had gotten the complete story. Not that Miller had anything to do with the destruction or concealment. I'm not I don't think he did, but there were a lot of folks, particularly at the subsidiary, that uh, kind of tried to protect him. Hmm. Who did you so, work with on this case? I worked with uh, Ken Lay and uh, Gary Sundet. Let me just take a look at, uh, let me just see who signed the complaint. Now I'll tell you exactly. Gary Sundet, Paul Fisher, uh, me, and another staff attorney, Jonathan Eisenberg. That complaint was filed January of 1980. The other thing I think that was bothering Proxmire was that uh, uh, 500 companies had joined the voluntary disclosure program. Textron had not. So, and that was, I think, also uh, creating additional interest. So, uh, as we know, the GAO William Miller became. Um... Fed chair. Um, so, how did that? How did the the case shake out in the end, and what effect did it have? Well, I think he was confirmed as we were launching our investigation. Okay. Then it got renewed interest when he was nominated to be Secretary of Treasury, and uh, Proxmire. Uh, you know, was still look still looking into things, and the issue of the payments came up again uh, during his uh, confirmation. I, I'm I just can't tell you chronologically whether our report had come out by the time he was up for confirmation as Secretary Treasury, but at some point it became clear that there were uh, millions of payments, questionable payments, all over the world it came out through our uh, our work. 
Did you uh, get a promotion, rise through the ranks at all during the course of that case? After that case, I was promoted <clears throat> in April of uh, 1982 after Stanley left by uh, John Fetters. Um, some other people from, from the Stanley Sporkin years before we move over into the, the Vetter's years. Um, you mentioned Ted Levine. Um, there were Ted Levine, Dave Doherty, Wall Wallace Timoney. Uh, they would have been Sporkin's lieutenants. Is that right? Right. And what, I had Wally in line with, with our branch. So I would, uh, I would obviously discuss things with, with Wally. He was... He, he was in in uh, in line of the super supervision of, of my branch. Tell me about him. What what kind of leadership did he exert? Uh, thoughtful, uh, you know, probing, uh, but you know, also very tough. Okay. Ted, Ted was not a supervisor of mine, although I interacted with Ted and Ed, and. Ed Hurley quite a bit on policy issues. You did some other interesting work um, we mentioned regarding the John Evans renomination. Um, sounds like you, you got in fairly closely with Stanley Spork and, and he asked you to, to do some sort of additional uh, task. Tell me about that. Uh, John Evans was up for renomination. Uh, we were told that Chairman Williams advised the White House that he preferred someone other than John Evans. The speculation was that between John Evans and Earl Pollock, Stanley still had uh, basically uh, uh, what he wanted out of the commission. Um, so the word was out that Evans was in trouble. And I talked to Stanley about that. I also spoke to Evans about that. And Stanley was quite willing to let me help uh, in any way I could. And I you know, took it upon myself uh, to do what I could. And that involved consulting the White House Director of Personnel. He used to be my boss when I worked for Al Lowenstein. Hmm. Um, I helped uh, letter writing by prominent Mormons. John was from, uh, from Utah. He came to Washington with the what I call the original Senator Wallace Bennett of Utah, chairman of the Banking Committee, or ranking member. Uh, Evans was a uh, uh, Republican uh, uh, member of the staff. And he comes to the commission with uh, the philosophy that to be conservative means to make sure the capital markets are clean. To make sure the capital markets are clean, we need good enforcement. We also need to get rid of fixed rate commissions. He was very big on that. Uh, he wanted competition so when you make a trade, you could choose which broker had a better commission rate for it. And you know, he was, in my, in my view, a tremendous person. I got to know him quite well, um, carrying out that uh, ingrained philosophy of his, of honesty, we need good enforcement. So uh, Jay Garn was chairman of the banking committee from Utah. That was a good uh, start, uh, but you know, other things were done. I had communicated with uh, Vice President Mondale's office, um, and I'm I'm not saying what yet that I was a reason why I got uh, renominated. I don't know. All I know is that uh, uh, Stanley thought of if I wanted to do it, I can do that on my own time, and I and I did and just happened to be a very unique circumstance that one of my best friends was head of uh, White House personnel for, for, for President Carter. Also, the Burt Lance case had come out, 
uh, under under Sporkin, case authorized uh, by Evans and others. So that may have had a contributing factor to maybe uh, replacing Evans with someone else. But uh, he was renominated. He was renominated with Phil Loomis, another very fine commissioner, another Republican, former general counsel of the SEC. Uh, so uh, everyone's efforts uh, succeeded. So John Evans had some headwinds. Talk about some other other headwinds that the the enforcement group was facing at this point. Um, Roberta Carmel would have come in roughly at the same time you did. Um, you were also getting some second guessing from the general counsel's office. Yes, uh, I just remember Stanley at the table when recommendations would. Uh, be before the commission uh, would really have to go through a, a gut wrenching process trying to convince uh, Roberta Carmel to uh, authorize actions. And it was, you know, a great uh, a great burden on Stanley. It was it was a difficulty. Um, at the same time, uh, the, the general counsel's office was commenting on the enforcement recommendations. So I think Ted and Ed Hurley basically would uh, respond to uh, general counsel memos to the commission to the extent the memos did not uh, support the recommendation. And, you know, most of the time uh, the memos did support uh, the recommendations. So, I would say the uh, the burden on Stanley to uh, have a successful presentation uh, increased in light of um, the general counsel's oversight. I don't know if you call it oversight, but uh, or some would call it second guessing. Um, and then you'd have uh, Roberto Roberta Carmel uh, or, you know, articulating concerns she had with things that were before the the commission. You mentioned Senator Proxmire. He it sounds like he had a pretty good relationship with with Stanley Spork and, and the enforcement group. Uh, he did. He um, he saw what uh, Sporkin did with the uh, improper payment program. He saw what Sporkin did as a result of watching the Watergate hearings at home and noticing descriptions of black bags of cash, corporate cash, shareholder cash being transmitted uh, in, in various places and ra raise the question of um, how is this cash being accounted for? So Stanley's view was we needed a provision that required the companies to keep ac adequate books and records and to have uh, systems of you know internal financial controls. And Proxmire went a step further, had accepted those recommendations, and then had the anti-bribery provision tucked into the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. So those two prongs together. So Proxmire was uh, uh, an admirer of, of Sporkin. I've read accounts where he would ask nominees to the commission, can you promise me uh, you'll do nothing to uh, get rid of uh, Sporkin? Uh, so they, they had a very, uh, very close uh, relationship. Um, Stan also had a very close relationship with uh, the Defense Bar. You have, you know, leading uh, members of uh, the SEC Defense Bar uh, were great admirers of Spork. And so you had, you had that, and you, you also had Ralph Nader uh, as, as, as an admirer. Uh, Nader... Uh, thought that you know, there was someone in government, you know, do, really doing something. Ultimately, Sporkin decided to leave. Uh, right. And it, it would have been, what, what, was it during the Textron case? I guess it would have been that time. He left after the Textron case. Okay. Okay. Um, 
And something that came up, I guess, in that transition, there's the transition to the, the Shad Fetters uh, leadership. Um, the city group case is, is often mentioned um and it was a, a pretty big landmark and that you've got this this big enforcement case and essentially um fetters pulls the plug and says we're not going to do it um goes against a staff recommendation um was was that something that, that you viewed as a landmark i viewed it as a signal that showing illegality by itself uh, would have a hard time getting through uh, Fetter's office. But Tom Von Stein I worked like a dog, I think, for over a year on, on this case. And he found evidence of uh, foreign currency manipulations resulting in tax avoidance, if not tax fraud. And, you know, included uh, false books and records that these were you know, separate books were kept for various things. I didn't. I never saw the report. But I just, re, you know, remember uh, re reading about it. And I think uh, Fetter's position was, uh, you need more to show a violation of the securities laws. And so that was a signal. I think that you, you needed you needed more than just. Um, violating other other laws uh, but you know our, our my understanding was if you have false books and records there's no materiality uh, threshold for for false books and records and if the risk presented by the illegal activities such as discovery by the foreign governments um, and imposition of fines, and perhaps restrictions in doing business in those countries, just like the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act had had concerns with, you would think that that would be enough for securities violations. So th this was a signal that uh, uh, these things would be reviewed very carefully. Did that have an effect on staff morale in general? I I don't know for sure. It was not it was not articulated to me. Okay. How did your job change uh, when John Fetters came in? John Fetters was one of the defense lawyers for Textron. And here I am with a new boss who uh, I interacted with uh, quite a bit when he was at Arnold Porter. Uh, John Jerry Hawk was lead, lead uh, defense counsel at Arnold Porter, but John was very actively involved. So um, he knew I was a Sporkin disciple and he promoted me anyway. And I think he did others as well. So my view was he had a meritocracy in mind that, that he wanted for the division. And, you know, we, we got along fine. I didn't agree with everything he did, obviously, but we got along. We got along with, you know, fine. Had um, the hobnail boots edict come down early on? Sure. And to support that, Fetters was instrumental working with the State Department and working with the Swiss to loosen up access to information that would be necessary to identify uh, overseas inside a trade. And that was consistent with uh, Chairman Shad's dictates that inside trading will be a top priority for the division. And one thing holding that up was these uh, foreign laws making it difficult to identify these people. And I know Fetters had worked closely with our ambassador to Switzerland, or uh, name escapes me, but they had a, they had a good relationship, and I think uh, uh, it produced uh, good results. There, ultimately, there was the MOU uh, with Switzerland. Yes. So you were involved in an insider trading case. Talk about the Santa Fe case. Uh, take me through that one from the front to back. Okay. 
Uh, the Santa Fe case involved um, an impending acquisition by Kuwait Oil Company, which is basically a foreign entity and foreign, foreign government entity. Um, they were going to take over Santa Fe, which was uh, an oil services uh, company, quite a, quite a big one. And there was concern that some members of Congress uh, would be concerned over um, an Arab country uh, taking over a U.S. oil company. And that there would be a need to do some legwork ahead of time to calm the waters. And therefore, that led to uh, Santa Fe engaging a public relations firm with ties to the Congress. And therefore, the public relations firm knew in advance that this uh, merger, this acquisition would take place. And there was a trading by someone at the public relations firm, trading by one of that person's uh, good friends, uh, trading by the, the brokerage firm that, that was used uh, to execute their options. I think uh, one person uh, put in two thousand dollars in uh, out of the money call options and made two hundred thousand overnight. That kind of thing. So uh, we took a look at it. Took a lot of testimony, and a lot of it did not make sense to us. We were concerned about what was being told to us under oath. So instead of uh, recommending an enforcement action. We wrote up a recommendation to the commission that they refer the matter to the Department of Justice. Criminal referral. Uh, commission approved the referral. Um, U.S. Attorney of District of Columbia and Department of Justice uh, took the case and ran with it. Carol Bruce was the Assistant U.S. Attorney and she saw that someone someone uh, was not uh, being truthful. And she conferred immunity on someone who finally came clean and broke broke the log jam, and then everything flowed from there. And it resulted for you know first you know a couple of criminal convictions. And um, I think the quote was that, U.S. Attorney for the District of Columbia called this the most significant inside trading case yet ever referred to the U.S. Department of Justice from, from the uh, Securities and Exchange Commission. Uh, I worked very closely uh, with the U.S. Attorney's Office. I don't know if, it, if I was a special uh, assistant U.S. Attorney, but we worked, we worked very closely. I was totally authorized as part of the referral. To share to share information. What kind of work did you do? Uh, just making sure that uh, all the facts that we had developed were fully understood. Uh, where where there were gaps, based on the information given to us, I and mean, we did a very thorough investigation. Uh, one of the brokers had told us that. He traded because he had overheard someone at, at, at the bar at Nathan's restaurant, which used to be a hot Georgetown place. Had my first date with my, the woman who became my wife at that restaurant. Uh, but he, he overheard it at the bar. And uh, we then subpoenaed all the uh, credit card receipts for that night. Um, no matchup. There was also uh, a private club where someone said they might have heard something. We so we subpoenaed all the chits from uh, from the private club. I mean, we uh, heavily used uh, phone records, 
there was a very curious while you're out message slip taken by a, a secretary at the public relations firm at I think 11.57 p.m. shortly minutes after the announcement and uh, someone had left a message for the person at the firm and it had two words on it home run exclamation point so then there were some excuses as to what home run meant and we said you know let's let's package this up and give it to the doj and see what they can do how long did that investigation take oh i don't know let's see um Good year. Okay. I'm just trying to get a sense of, of how things worked. While you're working on this case, would you also have others or would, you know, attorneys, uh, enforcement attorneys essentially be on a case, one case, and then move to another to another? I, uh, I would say I devoted 80% of my time to this case okay. and I wasn't the only one working on it by any means. Okay. Anything else we should talk about on, on the Santa Fe case? Mm, no. Okay. Uh, another case you're involved in with was uh, a regulated entities case. SEC v. Agron. Well, SEC versus uh, Agron involves a practice by which a company um, that was going through an underwriting would under disclose the amount of compensation the underwriter would receive. And there were like eight, eight to 12 of these companies that all use the same underwriter. And if I remember correctly, there was uh, private aircraft and other expenses that were not included in what the estimate and final disclosures were made as to uh, the total amount of underwriters compensation. And well, that was in terms of regulated entities, we had the public companies and you had the regulated underwriter. And uh, that was a case out of the Denver Regional Office, where Denver Regional Office was, again, needed some, some support in, in breaking through and piecing this together. It took, took a long time. And uh, the case was actually filed after I left the commission. Anything else we should talk about regarding your time in enforcement? I I don't think so. It was you know perhaps the best year, best six years of my uh, professional life. Uh, I made the right choice. In coming to the SEC? Yes. Okay. How about the choice to leave? Choice to leave, uh, six years. I wasn't intending to be a, a career person. Um, Stanley had left a few years before to go to the CIA. He did ask me if I would be interested in coming with him. And... Uh, he said, you know, he, he would guarantee me sufficient foreign travel, you know, presumably to set up dummy corporations <laughs> overseas. But, uh, I, you know, I was still enjoying it and and uh, decided uh, uh, to stay at a disclosure agency instead of going to the ultimate and non-disclosure agency. Uh, he had a very dear friend who was the CIA director. 
former SEC chairman himself and uh, Bill Casey. So uh, it, made, it made sense why Casey would want Sporkin over there. Uh, so I declined the offer, stayed. And then uh, uh, when I left, I went into uh, private practice, starting at Steptoe and Johnson as an associate until I got a call uh, years later from Judge Stanley Sport. Is this in the early to mid 80s, something like that? Yes. Okay. What did Judge Stanley Sporkin want to talk about? This was in the um, early 1986. Um, he had just been confirmed to be U.S. District Court Judge for the District of Columbia. And he calls and says, Gene, you know, there's no way I can get clerks in from the law school system. Uh, would I consider uh, coming over to be uh, his first law clerk, along with Bob LaProd, who was even older than I was, and we would be the first two uh, law clerks. LaProd had worked for Stanley at the commission for, for years. And I said, well, you know, this is usually a job for someone right out of law school. And I'm in private practice. Oh, come on, we'll have fun. Uh, you know, I can't get these people in until the until the fall and all this stuff. So thought about it. And I said, okay, I will I will do it. And I had made arrangements. Uh, ahead of time. Now I go back into private practice after the clerk clerkship, and I and I hooked up with a uh, uh, a white collar boutique firm that was a pretty pretty hot firm under the direction of uh, Paul Perito. Um. So it was like uh, you know it was it was planned out in advance. At the end of the clerkship, I would. I go to the uh, Paul Perito, uh, what I call a boutique. So I did it, and I did it from uh, April of 86 through September of 86. What was it like going going back to that position that, that normally people get right out of law school? Um, well, I was able to draft some pretty good opinions for, the, for Stanley's review, including one that... Uh, extended immunity to uh, people at the federal, at the FDIC who are being sued personally for not approving some arrangements that led to the demise of some SNLs. And Stanley uh, uh, knows how important it is for uh, the government folks to do their job without worrying about personal liability in the absence of tremendous wrongdoing. So it was called the it was Biscayne, Florida, it was a Biscayne case. So we got to draft that one. But uh, uh, it was uh, wonderful to see his interactions with uh, the jurors. He had tremendous respect for the jurors, would uh, make sure they were well treated, uh, well taken care of. But I did see some signs of what he had uh, put forward at, during his time at the SEC. We had a case involving uh, alleged police brutality uh, where a mentally disabled uh, young man was walking down the street and he saw the police uh, chasing him, so he ran. And for whatever reason, uh, he had to go to the hospital with, with some injuries. Uh, the medical problems were fully documented in the hospital records. Some, something happened. No one had reported the incident. Through an association for disabled persons, he was able to get a pretty good attorney to, to bring suit. The problem was uh, they couldn't identify the police officer who uh, led the attack on 
physical attack on him. I think they had uh, one number from a badge, police badge, but that was about it. So you had the Metropolitan Police blaming the Capitol Police, the Capitol Police blaming, we have like three or four various uh, police organizations protecting us in, in the District of Columbia. And so Stanley's hearing this, and he says, you know, we gotta, we gotta find out who this person is. So he says, I'm ordering the D DC Police Department to conduct an internal investigation to find out who this uh, police officer is. And I remember sitting in the courtroom and the, the lawyer for, uh, I guess it was the DC Corporation Council representing the police, said, Your Honor, we, we're not sure you have the authority to do that. He says, I think I do. And he ordered it and they found out who it was. So he was willing to push boundaries there as well. At least in that instance, yes. Okay. And it was a retooling process for me. I mean, to be back in the court on a daily basis from uh, slip and fall diversity cases to constitutional cases. I uh, got to know other judges, other clerks. He was very close to uh, Judge Ritchie. And uh, when Judge Ritchie died, uh, Stanley took in his clerks and they kept kept working. And uh, that was quite a quite a great thing that he did there. Did you stay in touch after you moved on? Uh, yes. <clears throat> he appointed me uh, to be a special master in a case where I would resolve uh, multiple discovery disputes that were just clogging things up. Uh, both sides agreed to the appointment. And I would have uh, meetings to uh, discuss the discovery disputes, and that that was all worked out. So that was a, a, a not a special map, yeah, it was special master, I would say, you know, a special master. Um, when he left the bench, I uh, asked him to help me assist a foreign auditing firm in approving uh, their uh, uh, compliance procedures as an auditor of a foreign company with U.S. listings. So he would come overseas with us uh, occasionally on that. Um, one of the things he liked to do when he was a judge is to have receptions for his current clerks and for his interns. And I try not to miss those. Um, unfortunately, one day I did go to one and I met someone who I eventually married. So he considered himself uh, the cause and he was, and he was my best man at that wedding. Oh, how about that? But we, stepped, we kept in touch. Um, I did use him uh, when I could to, when I needed his prestige and knowledge to, to help clients looking at uh, improving compliance. Um, we would have lunch in his law office and um, I kept kept it going and until he became very sick. Okay. Something I noticed that was interesting is um, after you were in private practice, you continued uh, uh, working on SEC topics, uh, writing, um, teaching. Tell me about the work you did. Um, particularly, you, you did a study of ALJs. Yes, uh, there's a lot of uh, statements being made that people could not get their day in court by going before an administrative law judge. So what we did, we went back a few years and we looked at the relief that was being requested by the staff and what the ALJ ultimately decided. And we found quite a few instances where the staff did not get nearly uh, what they had asked for and sometimes would you know, even lose the case. So we documented those findings 
and the National Law Journal published uh, the findings. So it was the first inventory of how uh, respondents fared uh, when they were named as a respondent in SEC administrative law proceedings. And um, it got quite a wide reception. And I think others have uh, updated it in, in, in the year since. I'm, pre I'm pretty sure I saw someone update it in the year since. So we did that one. And then uh, we came to the 10th anniversary of the PCAOB. And I noticed that no one had done an inventory on how they had fared in the 10 years of their existence. So we took a close look at that and uh, let me just let me just grab it for a moment. So we we basically took a look at uh, key enforcement cases, um, the development of uh, the new standards, the PCOB standards, the inspections process, which was very important, and we put it together in uh, Bloomberg. Uh, published it, and it was the first, uh, it's called the PCOB Mission, Improving Audit Quality Via Enforcement Standards and Inspections. One of my areas of concentration is uh, auditing defense, so this, this fit in with that quite well, and uh, the book the book got some good play. It's already outdated, obviously, yeah. but uh, so so we did that. Um, the University of Texas has a Washington unit called the LBJ School of Public Affairs. They have a Washington component uh, to that program, to the University of Texas program. And I put together a course for their Master's in Public Affairs program for, for the folks in the program who were there. Um, during that period of time. And what I did was attract um, harm to investors, uh, financial crises, and what was the legislative reaction to what apparently were gaps in what the SEC could do, and we started with uh, the Depression and worked our way through Dodd-Frank. Heavy emphasis on Sarbanes-Oxley, the Remedies Act. So that hole that Stanley tried to fill in through the equitable powers uh, gave way to express uh, law that gave him the powers he, he always dreamed of having. So the course was basically taking everyone through uh, those statutes, Remedies Act, Sarbanes-Oxley, and uh, Dodd-Frank. And we uh, relied uh, on Professor Seligman's book, Transformational Wall Street for, for, for early days. I took all the students over to see Commissioner Stein when she was an SEC commissioner, so they could hear from her directly on what it meant to be an SEC commissioner. And, uh, uh, the role and mission of, of the SEC. So that, that, so that, that was a lot of fun. So I've, I've tried to uh, keep my hand in it. I uh, judge moot court at Georgetown Law and Catholic Law. And um, I've written multiple articles uh, while at McDermott on various uh, securities law issues. Well, the teaching in, in particular is interesting because you've been able to go back over and and take a look at the history that you participated in, in particular. Right, right. So I think you have the syllabus, so you can see um, how it migrated through the FCPA and uh, the accounting provisions, uh, which are 
I think, off, more often used for non-bribery cases than for bribery cases, and how important uh, they became. Well, is there anything else we should talk about from your time at, at the commission? Uh, let's see. Uh No, I think I think you, you you covered it well, Ken. I appreciate it. Well, I appreciate it. It's been a lot of fun. Uh, it's been a lot of fun talking about your time there, talking about Stanley Sporkin and, and and the history overall. Thank you very much. All right, Ken. Thank you. Take care now. Bye bye.